Galileo, born in 1564, was an Italian astronomer, physicist, and engineer, and has been notably called the father of observational astronomy. He invented the thermoscope and various military compasses, and used the telescope for scientific observations of celestial objects. Galileo's work lives on today, but presented in a different light, by Harvard professor and theoretical physicist Avi Loeb. Avi joins me today to talk about the Galileo project and if maybe it might just answer the age old question. Are we alone? Join us as we get rebelliously curious. Hi Avi. Thank you for joining me on rebelliously curious today. I'm going to start off really, really simple. What is a day in the life like the average day, like for Avi Loeb? Well, thanks for hosting me. And uh, this is a very easy question to answer. I wake up around uh, 5 a.m. every day since the pandemic started. And uh, I jog uh, when nobody is around. Uh, in fact, I enjoy uh, very much the company of birds, ducks, uh, rabbits, uh, wild turkeys. There is even a fox that I meet every now and then. And uh, it's much more rewarding, I should say, meeting nature uh, on its own, much more rewarding than interacting with people. Uh, I don't have any social media account. I don't uh, care so much about how many likes I have on Twitter. So going out to nature for half an hour, jogging out is amazingly relaxing. And uh, uh, then when I get back home, I have a breakfast. And after that, well, it depends which day, but most of the days during the last six months since my book appeared, uh, most of them were back-to-back -back interviews. I had about a thousand, inter more than a thousand interviews uh, since the end of January when uh, Extraterrestrial appeared. And uh, this book was uh, translated to 25 uh, languages and uh, there might even be a documentary produced uh, about it. And uh, it was just a lot of work um, from 8 a.m. till 7 p.m. back-to-back interviews almost every day. And that's what my day looks like. And of course, within the day, I have also some meetings with the students and postdocs uh, because I'm doing some scientific work at the same time. Wow. Yeah, you're, you're busy. And I'm not surprised. Like you've been doing so much work in so many different areas, uh, along with raising fun with funds for the new project that you're working on. Uh, before we get into the Galileo project, I'd like to ask you a little bit about your earlier background. Uh, in the early 80s, you were working on the Strategic Defense Initiative, also known as the Star Wars Project. Can you tell me a little bit about that project that you worked on earlier in your career and then how it compares and is different to the work that you're doing now? Right, so I was born on a farm uh, in Israel and I was mostly interested in philosophy. And then at age 18, uh, one is supposed to serve in the military, that's obligatory. And, uh, but there was a, a, a sort of a loophole that allowed me to continue to think rather than run in the fields with a gun. Uh, and that loophole was a special program, an elite program that uh, uh, selects uh, 20 to 30, recruits uh, every year uh, to study physics and mathematics and then use it for the defense of the country. And the program was established just a year before I was drafted. And uh, fortunately, I was good in physics and was admitted to the program. And of course, that allowed me to work on uh, and uh, research intellectual activity that resembles the most uh, philosophy, the, the love of, of my life, so to speak. And, uh, and then um, I wanted to continue doing research rather than become a, a manager of a project in the industry during my military service. And uh, I was fortunate enough to be allowed to do that because uh, I was good in sports. I, I, I excelled in the military training. We went to, we parachuted, we drove tanks, we um, did a lot of uh, physical uh, activity that uh, allowed me to get uh, credited by the officers and they basically allowed me to do what I really wanted which is research scientific research and uh, so I established um, 
a research program that was the first one supported by the Strategic Defense Initiative internationally. It was the first international program to get funded by the US. And uh, I remember General Abramson was leading that program. He visited us and was very impressed by the proposal. And it became a whole department. We were funded at a few million dollars a year. And I used to visit uh, Washington DC quite for, uh, every few months. And because we were funded, I had to report about the, the results. And in one of the visits, uh, I went to uh, visit Princeton and uh, the Institute for Advanced Study and was introduced to Freeman Dyson, who introduced me to John Bacall, who was an astrophysicist. And he invited me for another visit and then offered me a five-year fellowship there after I finished my military service. And then, um, you know, that was under the condition that I switched to astrophysics. Again, it was an offer I couldn't refuse. And just like in the Godfather, you know, I had to accept it. Uh, and then I was offered a faculty position at Harvard. I was not their top choice. They offered it to someone else. And then uh, I was second uh, in line because that person said that there is no chance of getting tenured at Harvard. So I, he preferred to go somewhere else. And uh, when I got there, you know, I didn't have um, great expectations. If I wouldn't get tenured at Harvard, I would go back to the farm. I had plan B um, and I wasn't stressed out about it. Uh, and then three years later, I was tenured. And uh, at that point, it was too late to give up on physics or astrophysics. But I realized that even though it was an arranged marriage, I'm actually married to my true love. Because in astrophysics, there are philosophical questions, you know, that we can address using the scientific question and the scientific method. And uh, one of them is, are we the smartest kid on the block? A hundred percent. And that leads so well into the Galileo project. Can you tell us a little bit about what that project consists of uh, and what you're working on uh, within like the parameters within the project? Right. So um, about a month ago, the uh, Pentagon delivered a report to Congress in the US. And um, uh, in the report was the admission that uh, there are some objects above the sky uh, of the US that whose nature is not identified. And that's an admission of failure as far as the intelligence agencies are concerned. And it's quite unusual for the government to say, we don't do our job, right? And that's yes. what they said. <laughs> um, and so, because if it was clear that this belongs to another nation as a part of uh, espionage or right. uh, some other, then uh, it would not have been delivered to Congress in this way. So, and people, obviously the, the thing to recognize is we are seeing just the tip of the iceberg. There is much more evidence that is classified because it was obtained by classified sensors. Mm -hmm. So the govern government will never release it because it will reveal what kind of sensors are monitoring the sky. And that's not information you want adversaries to have. Yeah. But, yeah, so shortly after the report was uh, delivered, the, the head of NASA, uh, stated that uh, it's about time for scientists to look into this. And uh, that's Bill Nelson. And I completely agreed with him uh, because, um, you know, when you see things on the sky that you don't understand, uh, you want to ask astronomers to figure them out, right? That's the job of scientists. It's not the matter of the talking points of politicians or military personnel. Uh, you wouldn't ask a plumber to bake you a cake. These people were not trained as scientists. So um, I, at that point, I approached people under Bill Nelson and asked if I can help. I'm, I said, I'm, I'm here to serve and make your boss happy. So nobody got back to me. And then uh, a week later, uh, the administrator of the astronomy department at Harvard writes me an email and says, you have a, a new research fund. And I say, what do you mean I have a new research? That never happens, you see, in academia. Uh, you can do fundraising and most of the time you don't get anything. Uh, and I said, who gave me that money? Would you mind please telling me so that I can thank that person? And she said, you know, I don't know how to contact this person. And I said, well, I'm, I'm making an elementary request. Someone gave me money and I'm asking to know who that person is so that I can thank that person. Don't you think it's elementary? Like this is something rather 
legitimate for me to ask for. Yes. And uh, it took them a day and they got back to me the contact information of that person. And I thanked that person. But then another person showed up, a multi-billionaire showed up in my porch uh, at home and uh, had questions about my book. These people simply read my book, Extraterrestrial, or uh, followed the thousand interviews I had since the book came out. And uh, they were excited by the vision. And uh, so this other person asked me questions about my book and then said, I'm willing to contribute to your project, to your research. Wow. No strings attached. And altogether, within two weeks, I got uh, $1.75 million. It's and unbelievable. That, uh, yeah, without any fundraising uh, attempts on my, be uh, on my behalf. And um, at that point, I said, okay, I can just do it. I don't need the, someone else approval for that. I can just go ahead and do it. And so I assembled a team of exceptional scientists, and uh, we defined the Galileo project um, together with um, one of the funders that um, I worked with, um, uh, Frank Laukian. He's the CEO of the Brooker Corporation. And, um, and then we um, announced the project on July 26, exactly a month after the UAP report was delivered to Congress. And um, the amazing thing is since then, in the last few days, I got thousands of emails from people that are very interested in supporting the, the project, either financially or uh, in, in terms of uh, scientifically, in terms of their uh, time and, and effort. And um, it illustrates two points that I try to emphasize in the past six months, that the scientific community should not shy away from the question of whether there are relics of extraterrestrial civilizations near Earth because the public is very excited about the prospects of, the, of discovering something of that type. And the public funds science, so that's an opportunity to get more funds into science. And moreover, it's an opportunity to attract young people into science. I was saying that abstractly, but over the past week, I demonstrated both points. I got funded. And I got a huge number of people showing interest in the project. So it's not abstract anymore. It's a reality now. And it's called the Galileo Project. And we can talk about what our goal is. Yeah. And, and also, I want to ask you, too, about, you know, there's lots of ridicule within the science community when you start going down roads like this. I'd imagine that you've come across it throughout your career. And now you've come to a point where scientists are coming to you to work with you and are more interested in people are funding. How do you get scientists out of their comfort zone and into this type of subject? Well, by uh, arguing for something that makes sense. Now, I think, you know, people can resist something that makes sense, uh, but not all people will resist it. There would be some people that will be excited by something that makes sense. And um, it's true that the scientific community is slow to respond, but the public you know, I'm going beyond the small bubble of the people in academia speaking with each other, tweeting negative things and so forth. Right. There is a world out there of people that, you know, uh, have the right sense of what we should do. And uh, I'm speaking with them and they get excited and I have enough momentum now to have 50 people in the team uh, of the Galileo project working on it. And uh, my hope is to bring this subject to the mainstream of science. I think eventually it will get there, but it takes time. And there is a simple way to basically bring everyone to my mindset. And that is getting a high resolution image of an yes. object that shows that it's not natural because you can see the bolts, because you can see the uh, label saying made on exoplanet X, not made in country Y here on Earth, uh, because you can see features that make it not a rock. Like there was this object, the first one from outside the solar system that was discovered in 2017, Oumuamua, and right. my book was dedicated to it. And it didn't look like a comet or an asteroid. So I said, well, maybe it's artificial. And then I, I was attacked personally for that, suggesting that. 
because people said, you need extraordinary evidence before you can even talk about it. And I said, well, you would never get that evidence if you dismiss it ahead of time. You need to invest funds be before you find the evidence. You know, that's the way gravitational waves were detected. The National Science Foundation invested $1.1 billion in the search. We've invested hundreds of millions of dollars in the search for dark matter. We don't know what most of the matter in the universe is. That's part of the mainstream. We're searching in the dark. People suggested some types of particles. They searched for them, didn't find anything. So is that a waste? No, but it's part of the mainstream to search for something you don't know whether it exists. So <laughs> why? I mean, we know that we exist. We know that we sent out Voyager, New Horizons, we are sending equipment into space. And we know that half of the sun-like stars have a planet the size of the Earth, roughly the same separation. So if you arrange for similar circumstances, why wouldn't you get things like us in the past that sent a lot of equipment into space? Why wouldn't we search for that? All I'm saying is, let's look for evidence. That should be part of the mainstream, just like searching for weakly interacting massive particles is part of the mainstream of astronomy, despite the fact that we haven't found any. So my point is, uh, it makes sense to the public. It's important because it will have a huge impact on society if we find evidence for a smarter kid on the block. Yeah, and I actually want to go into that too. So what if you do find something? What is going to be the protocol that you go about explaining this to media or to the general public, because obviously, obviously it's privately funded so that you can really disseminate this information any way you like. And if you find something, obviously that is going to be the, one of the most amazing discoveries of mankind. So how do you have a plan, like a communications plan of how you're going to go about explaining this or disseminating this type of information that's that you're going to find or any type of evidence that you might find? Well, the path would be quite similar to any scientific experiment. Um, you know, when an important discovery is made, then there is a press conference where right. the team reveals the result to the public. Uh, but in this case, you know, it's just like a fishing expedition. We don't know what kind of fish will come in our hook. We just send the hook. In this case, it's telescopes looking at the sky, equipped with cameras and uh, taking a video of the sky, you know, in many locations. So we will have a network of telescopes and the video that we take of the sky will be fed into computer systems that will filter it out, look for objects of interest and then track them, okay? And uh, that is the hook. And then the question is what kind of fish will we catch? Mm -hmm. And it really depends on the type of fish, you know, if for example, we catch a fish that says made in a specific country here on earth, now, that would be a matter of national intelligence, right? It's not uh, something to do with astronomy. That data is not, I would not regard as scientifically exciting. It's actually quite boring to know that, well, that the intelligence agencies missed an opportunity to realize that another country has a more advanced technology than we imagine. Yes. Okay. So, but I don't think that's the case because, you know, the government would be very careful at reporting to Congress that they don't understand the nature of objects and then it, they must have checked, you know, based you would on hope. intelligence. Yeah. Yeah. That's <laughs> what I would any, think. Is there any yeah. funding that, um, we know that you've had multiple different types of funders um, and we spoke a little bit about that previously, but has any former government or government officials tried to fund this? And then if not, um, would you accept government funding down the road? Um, funding, I have... Yeah, maybe, but no, I, I don't want to look at classified data because that would limit my freedom uh, because the government will put restrictions on what I can say. And then uh, even when I deal with new data, which is the goal of the Galileo project, we, we don't want to, dis to, to use uh, data that was obtained by instruments that were not optimized, like a camera in a jittery cockpit of a fighter jet, you know, that, that is not really data that is useful scientifically because you don't know exactly what the jet was doing at the time and um, you have no control over the quality of the camera and so forth. And what we want to do is use scientific instruments that are state of the art that we have full control over, not relying on people, by the way. I mean, even though in the courtroom, 
you know, the corroborating evidence by eyewitnesses can put a person in jail. But you can't write a scientific paper based on what someone tells you. You can't say this person said that, and that's my evidence. That doesn't hold water in science. You have to rely on instruments that give you quantitative data that you had full control over. So you know exactly what, what went into them, and then you understand what came out of them. And that's the way science operates. So we want to, have, to use better instruments than uh, uh, those that were used for the information that was so far uh, leaked to the public. Um, and, uh, and then uh, in order to discuss the data openly and in a transparent way, I don't want to see classified information so that I will be free to act as a scientist. And if the government is interested in funding an open data project like the Galileo project, that would be wonderful. But if it comes with strings attached, I prefer not to have those strings. That makes sense. I, I, I would agree. You want to be able to be free to observe. When you're looking, you know, using telescopes from around the world, how are you narrowing in? Like, how are you observing the sky when you do this? Uh, are you starting in a specific area? Um, is there, is are there, or there sections within the, uh, within the universe that you want to be looking at? Like how, how do you go about doing that? Right. So first we need to decide on the size of the telescope that we want to build, that we want to, to use. And uh, I should say that all of the components of the systems that we will use can be bought off the shelf. We are not the ones building them, but we buy the components. So for example, we buy a telescope and we need to decide about the size of the telescope, the properties of the telescope, and then the camera that will be connected to it, and then the computer system. So all of this is one telescope facility or one system. And then the location of each system will have to be determined. So the best location is of course mountaintops where you don't have much blurring of the image. That's why astronomical observatories are placed on mountaintops. But these are not necessarily the best places to look for UAP because some people claim that they cluster in some geographical location. So the more telescopes we have, the better, because then we can put them in, in many locations. Of course, some of them, for example, near military facilities are protected. We, we can't access them and we would not do that. Um, but uh, most of the sky, is not classified. And astronomers look at the sky all the time. So the difference between the systems that we will use and existing telescopes is that existing telescopes are focusing on distant objects very far away. And if a bird flies above them, they ignore it. If a bird would fly above our system, we will look at it. We want to know that it's a bird and not something else. We will try to dismiss birds and dismiss airplanes, things that we know, but look for unusual phenomena. And it will be a computer system that will do the filtering because we can't store all the data. It's a huge amount of data. And uh, so the idea is to have as many systems as possible. And with the current budget that we have, we can at least have 10 or maybe several nice. tenths. Uh, but if we get uh, 10 times more funding, we could have hundreds of those systems, which would be much better based on rough estimates of the, in, in terms of the number of UAP that were reported uh, per unit area on Earth. Uh, we need hundreds of such systems. So that means we need tens of millions for the pro project in order to have a comprehensive study of this question. Uh, currently, we have 1.75 million but we can definitely demonstrate that uh, we get uh, interesting data with the current funding. And my hope is that within a year or two, we'll get interesting data. Yeah, I would imagine. And then how do you go about planning a timeline like this? Like what is the expected timeline? And then how often is it that you'll run into or come across something like a Miomu again? Oh, okay. So I should clarify, there are two types of objects. One is UAP. Right. These are objects close to Earth, and those can be resolved uh, by those telescopes that I was mentioning before. Right. In fact, if you imagine a, an object the size of a person, roughly at a distance of a mile, you can get a megapixel image of that 
uh, object, meaning you can resolve it down to the scale of a millimeter, the head of a pin, uh, so you can read off the label where it was made <laughs> easily with a one meter telescope. So uh, telescopes with uh, a diameter between a tenth of a meter to a meter, you know, they can do the job of resolving UAP for us. But we might also use radar systems and uh, infrared sensors and other uh, ways of detecting those objects. Those are objects that are relatively close to us uh, at a distance of miles, you know. Um, but Oumuamua-like objects, these are objects that came into the solar system from outside and uh, they don't look like a comet or an asteroid, they look weird. Uh, so Oumuamua was the first one in this class, this discovered in 2017, but we hope uh, to see more of the same class. And uh, there will be the Vera Rubin Observatory that is much more sensitive than the telescope that discovered uh, Oumuamua back in 2017. And in principle, the Vera Rubin Observatory that will start operations in a couple of years uh, from Chile uh, could find an object like that every month. And here the goal is to analyze the data coming from the Vera Rubin Observatory using software that we will develop, looking for things like that, and then designing a space mission such that we will send out a camera that will take a close-up photograph of an object that looks weird. And a close-up photograph will tell us whether it's artificial or natural, whether it's a rock or some piece of equipment, because they say a picture is worth a thousand words. In my case, a picture is worth 66,000 words, the number of words in my book. Right. I wouldn't need to write a book. It's not a philosophical question, you see. It's just having a single image of high resolution. That would solve the issue. So here's a question then. If you get an, a picture of a UAP really close up and it's an off-world object, how are you evaluating that? Because if it's something that we don't have on this planet and our science isn't able to really explain it, how do we go about describing it? And how do we go about analyzing something like that? Even through well, hopefully it, will hopefully it will have a label or <laughs> right. some fault on it. Right. You know, there will be some features on it that look uh, interesting, that look technological. Um, and um, the question of what its intent is and what does it actually do uh, is a more complicated one. So yeah. to address that, it's not enough to just see it. You know, if you go uh, on a blind date and you see a person, that doesn't tell you much. About, you, you can't judge a book by its cover. Let's put it this way. Right. right. And so finding the intent of this object would depend on what kind of information is this object seeking. So you have to monitor it for a while and, and see what it's doing or this class of objects and do you have any uh, ideas what that might be have you spoken that as harvard as a group talked the 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 group that you're working with now have you talked about what that could possibly be and what it might look like no no we we just don't have any clue about the uap whether you know we don't know if they might be a natural phenomenon they might be some rare atmospheric uh, event you know that we haven't anticipated that was mistaken for an object maybe but uh, my point is, by getting more evidence, we can figure out the nature of these objects. And first of all, verify that they are real. And second, check whether they are natural in origin or artificial, okay? And if they are artificial, if some of them are, it's enough to have one that is artificial. We, you don't need more. So it, it may be a mixed bag. Maybe most of the UAP reports have some mundane explanations. But even if one, just one, happens to be an, an object from an extraterrestrial origin, that would have huge implications for us, for humanity. And if we do find one, then the question is, what is the intent of that one? You know, you, you might wonder, is it a Trojan horse? I mean, if it, even if it looks uh, innocent, it may have other intentions. And uh, one way to figure out if it's, for example, if it has uh, artificial intelligence, uh, we will need to use our own artificial intelligence systems to help us. It's just like relying on your kids to interpret um, what uh, you find on the internet because they are more computer savvy. Uh, so our AI systems will be needed to figure their AI systems, so to speak. And uh, 
but we shall see you know when we get there uh, and then of course once you realize what kind of information are these systems seeking uh, we could see how they respond to what we are doing and then eventually there will be a decision to be made whether to engage with them but that's down the road first we need to find an object that is not natural and right. i'm saying you know even if we don't find such an object and we just clear up the fog such that the public is not confused about it that by itself is a major contribution to the discussion yeah it really is and then where is the next timeline then for the galileo project like you're starting here do you have any ideas of what it might look like in the next like 10 to 20 years the evolution of it yeah so the way i envision it is in the coming weeks or months we select the instruments that we want to use the, and then purchase them and the number of telescope systems that we will use depends on how much funding we have and i very much hope that we will get to the tens of millions level uh, if there is any private uh, donor out there that cares about this question uh, please uh, email me um, and uh, uh, then of course we will test uh, some systems uh, just to make sure that we design them uh, so that they perform the way we want them to perform and that includes the telescope the camera connected to it and the computer system that will analyze the data and once we have a working system that we can trust and we know that it can identify what we are looking for then we deploy those systems in various locations and we have to decide where to put them and that will depend obviously on how many we have. And my hope is that within a, a year, we will have already systems that are collecting interesting data or useful data. It's amazing. And I really hope, and I think all of us uh, are really, really hopeful that you do find something. And I think that it's amazing that you're, you're even going down this road with a group of people from Harvard and looking at UAPs and looking at interstellar objects in a very serious light and an academic light. So thank you for that. I should say it's not just my group at Harvard. Uh, there are lots of, most of the people are actually from other universities. And the way I, I think of it is as a project for humanity. So uh, it can involve people from all nations uh, because it's not about us, the, the, those that are involved in this project is more about everyone. You know, we want to know whether we are alone, whether we are the smartest kid on the block. It's about our future as a species, so to speak. And before I even end this, then sh I should ask, you know, is this project, you know, the idea is to see if we can analyze and find more information about UAPs or interstellar objects, but is there an underlying goal of maybe this is something that might bring us together as, as one, as a, as one, as a planet? Well, if you look at the history of humans, uh, what you find is uh, we wasted a lot of resources on trying to feel superior relative to each other. And, and the best example is the Second World War, which was driven by racism, the, by Nazi Germany. And, you know, 75 million people died. That's 3% of the world population in that war. Just think about it in the context of COVID now. We're talking about 75 million just in one war initiated by racism. And uh, uh, you know, uh, two thirds of the Jewish population in Europe was killed and um, the US alone invested $4 trillion in that war. And so it shows you that, um, you know, humans do ridiculous things. And if, suppose we knew uh, that there is a more advanced culture out there, then all of our differences would look minuscule. You know, who cares what the color of the skin of a person is? Who cares what the ethnic origin of a person is if there is something far more advanced out there? You know, we are all humans and we should work together. And I hope that will be the message. And I love that. And I really hope so too. Thank you so much, Avi. And thank you for being rebelliously curious with me today. Thanks for having me.